Um, so the questions are on Rex's slide this morning. Um, what's remaining is, so what's necessary to integrate these data sets evidence into EHR and clinical use? Uh, I guess the talks we've heard this morning, is that enough? Are people, these tools that are being developed, um, should we just leave it to them to get on with it, or is anything else needed? Um, there's the question about um, education needed in the clinics in using this decision support systems. Um, and then there's this question of dynamic feedback um, back to improve the recommendations. So who wants to, yeah. So what I would um, set out for the speakers to comment on and others that wish to is um, uh, thinking about it from the uh, focus of this meeting, uh, we've heard some really, I think, nice approaches to how to do this, um, but as with many things, they're sort of individually developed for a specific purpose. What would be the potential role for NHGRI plus uh, partners uh, that would really help to facilitate this? What, what could be added that would allow this to move uh, more quickly? Well, one thought, I'm just throwing random thoughts on the table, but, um, you know, you, you all, or NHGRI-funded research, helps identify hunches, things that you think may be true based on maybe small studies, laboratory, things like the clopidogrel example. Um, folks like us have access to data and patients, but we don't, we don't, we're not in the middle, we're not in the thick of the kinds of questions that you all might have. So uh, an example of that was uh, we, we had a call that came into us from the National Cancer Institute about some work they were doing with uh, metformin and its relationship to P53 and did it or did it not relate to incident cancers. Or there was a recent uh, paper out that looked at digitalis and its relationship to um, metastatic cancer in the liver and how it may actually prevent genetically the, the growth of the tumor in the liver. Those kinds of questions that you may have, you know, just hunches about, we could quickly do some large-scale um, automated retrospective, relatively inexpensive studies not definitive, but at least to give you a sense, is, is, it, is it really kind of playing out in the real world? We would love to have a flow of uh, questions um, if that was some, some way of, of thinking about that. So, so I'd compare that with what happened with the human genome, where the genome was freely available, and so everybody downloaded it and played around with it and had hunches and ideas in the middle of the night and just coded them up and experimented with them. And that's where it's difficult to do it right now with, you know, you're talking about going and surveying over patient records and associated data you, because all the ethics gets in the way. So some of the systems being built in Scotland and in, the UK, you know, in, in England, the idea is at least to lower those barriers, but there will still be barriers. Uh, yeah, I'm, I think there always has to be barriers because it's just not the same situation. And you have to be careful. It is patient information. It is highly sensitive. But it is possible to build those systems. Um, one of the questions is about scalability of this sort of work. And it needs a major, major drive and push behind it to make it happen because it's all too bitty. Um, there's two, the little pockets of it and little bits of it happening all over the place. And it needs to be much more of a program, programmed activity that's much more systematic. We also actually need to, I think, um, one of the things that has puzzled me, you know, for quite some time um, is as an epidemiologist, um, uh, one of the things that's certainly happened in, in, in the UK is that uh, we had this kind of brain drain out of epidemiology going into bioinformatics. Um, uh, you know, you guys thought that's where the fun was. It's not. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so seriously, I mean, it was a very, it's been very difficult. We've had a real skills shortage. And one of the things that we need to actually start to do is actually bring the epidemiologists and the biostatisticians together with the bioinformatics people. We have a lot to learn from each other. Uh, our, our, our clinical data is dirty. It's messy. Um, it's, uh, it requires a lot of understanding about epidemiological issues like biases and confounding and so forth to make sense of it and to analyze it properly. Um, but for our scalability, we badly need to learn a lot more, I think, from a lot of the large-scale data approaches that have happened in, in, in genetics. 
I think that's a really important point. I just want to leap onto this since it relates directly to the strategic plan and, and the strategic planning meeting because I think we heard exactly that same um, uh, opinion stated from several people in that meeting that these are groups that we need to somehow aggregate and figure out um, the methodologies that could then be, you know, promoted to a group like a Medco or someone. So, you know, this and this relates to what we talked about yesterday about developing a suite of methodologies that we think have a certain amount of uh, validity and robustness within the clinical environment. So this seems to me to be something that we need to really flag as a takeaway to say, can we really uh, make this happen? Or, or is there a role that NHGRI can play in terms of making this happen? Thank you, Tim. Um, I have a request to make, because one of the issues that there is, is every time there's a loss of data, and invariably that loss is with inside the clinical process, we, the research end, get, get, the, get not the blame, but the pressure comes on us. <clears throat> in the 17 years that I've been involved in this area, as far as I'm aware, there has never been a loss of data from a research enterprise. But we really get hit in the neck every time there is a loss because we have the big data sets, you have the data of millions of people, you know, whereas hospitals have the data of hundreds of people or thousands of people. And so um, it, it, it has to become, I, I think, and one of the most interesting things from presentation, uh, three or four presentations ago, was in terms of integrating with the EHR has got round one of the major problems, which is the medico-legal issues of when you integrate something, who accepts the responsibility for it? Now, by getting the patient to consent for that, it neatly gets around the problem. And what we have to do is get the millions and billions of patients all sticking the box and saying, we understand the value of this, just get on and do more. And they have to saturate the 0. .00000, go on zeros, percent of people who are the do-gooders that try and say, you can't touch this data because you'll release something out there and someone will be identified. That is just not the way it is. So I, I think one of the things, go from this meeting and multiply, ensure that everyone in your hospital starts talking. And it just using that effect to get patients to say, do more of it, please. So I heard rumor, rumblings from over here. So does that mean that there has been a case of researchers releasing data? Yes, un unfortunately at our, our Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Um, we we um, uh, lost a laptop that had uh, MRI data on it that, that had patient names and I believe social security numbers, including a member of the Hill staff. Um, so it was a, a very high profile, and very embarrassing case. So my comment relates to, to the UK where we would... <laughs> Well, we, we, you know, we have strict rules. We don't put data on laptops at all. Exactly. We have those Not rules yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> and, if you, and if somebody does it, they get sacked. <laughs> but remember, the UK did manage to lose the, the oh, bank yeah. records of half the entire population yeah. of two DVDs. So. Not in yeah. the medical area, but. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, it is an issue. <laughs> I think the one thing that um, you're doing, and that perhaps if you, you can do more, if, if I understand what ClinVar is supposed to do, it can be an extraordinarily important resource because, you know, in our work, we have SNPs and we have these genetic variants on our watch list and saying, wh when, are, when do these rise to the point that we begin to integrate this with family history? But you go and you ask people from Harvard, you go, you go different sources, you get different answers about whether these have, have gotten to that level. And if ClinVar can step up sort of to be like an NCCN of that, where you can go to one source and say, look, this is now past the threshold, and we can incorporate that, that would be, that I think would be extraordinary, being the trusted agent, in other words. And I'm, I just want to clarify one thing I said about the patient report, because I, I realize it created a little controversy. An institution can decide that when a patient signs on, that report has to go to a clinician. I mean, those are institutional decisions. We, as the developers, didn't want to have that as a default. We want the institution to make those decisions. We didn't want a default because who knows where that report would go. We want to make sure that report only goes to, to people who are authorized to see it. So there is institutional control over that. But ClinVar, I think, is a great idea if, if it can rise to that level. <laughs>
Just say a warning, you know, remember that, of course, there's population effects. So if you get a, a variant in ClinVar, you know, it may work for some parts of the population, but not others. Steve Cherry wants to say. Yeah, I think to follow on that point, I think ClinVar is exactly imagined to be that, to serve that aggregating function. And on your point, it really needs, I think, a, a, a careful consideration on the data model for the epidemiological properties and the, yeah. and the quality of the evidence to facilitate this translation from tier two to tier three or up and down. I mean, there's an aggregation mm -hmm. convening function of data, but we want to be able to present the assertions or the evidence in, yeah. in an efficient way, as well as the conclusions that go up to the, uh, the decision support tools. Yeah, so one of the things that we've been quite interested in is trying to interface with people here um, on, uh, you know, having common data models, say, for things like drug exposures and so forth, and just making sure that we actually all use the same approach wherever it's possible or at least map to them. Um, so I think that's, that's a really important point. You know, if you want to get everybody, you want to multiply this effect, it's having common yeah. data models mm -hmm. and standards and maybe funders only supporting people who use the same models, things like that. Maybe problems about SNOMED because it's commercial, getting, buying SNOMED into the public domain. These are you know, practical yeah. things. That, a, a technical workshop on is, this yeah. might be an efficient it is public. next step as a recommendation. Yeah. SNOMED's public. SNOMED's public. You can use it. For the US. For the US. Yeah, but it can't be, but there's problems about redistribution. If you want to make a global system, you know, NCBI can't just stick it up in NCBI because it's, it unli it's not licensed for that. Well, we, we did get permission for anything that's a genetic disease. Yeah. And ultimately, there are lots of them. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, it's a genetic disease. Okay. Um, so, I'll, actually, I wanted to follow up uh, on the, uh, Bob Nuss from UCSF. I wanted to follow up on this issue about ClinVar because I think there's a there's a philosophical issue here that we really need to deal with, and that is, at what point does ClinVar have to um, give up and uh, give up its role uh, in curating this data? And so, the difference between standardization of nomenclature, standardization of data entry, um, quality control, making sure that the, if the if the two different people report a mutation that they're using the same base pair and the same amino acid, that's the sort of thing I think Clin ClinVar can be very good at. I think ClinVar can also be very good at putting in, for example, um, so-and-so thinks that this has the following validity, whereas so-and-so thinks it doesn't. But now the next step, which is being able to pull that information out and turn it into usable information. That, I think, requires curation. And how are we going to do that? Because I think that the general, my general experience dealing with uh, gene clinics, dealing with OMIM, dealing with a variety of other such databases is that we're not very good at supporting long-term curation efforts. And if we're talking about some sort of partnership that's going to require money, uh, I think that's an area where we really need to focus. Did you get that, Eric? <laughs> so um, I wanted to, I guess, amplify and comment on two of the themes that I've heard here, and these both, uh, again, come out of the NHLBI workshop we had a few months ago, so I think I'm speaking not just for myself, but, but for many others. Um, one is to build on the comment about um, not losing data. And I would argue, and, and I think we discussed this at the meeting, again, with the NHLBI workshop, that it's not just getting more people to participate, but it also refers to any data that is generated in a laboratory test. And there was general consensus that we never want something to be lost and erased just because it was deemed not clinically valid, not to have clinical utility, not actionable, whatever. The data still needs to be maintained, preserved, annotated, kept available because it may become relevant in the future. And I think this very importantly tags on to what Bob said emphatically and clearly yesterday, that as a clinician, we just need to know the creatinine is four or the variant is such and such. And sometimes we have no clue what it means. And sometimes we already know about it and we're nonplussed. Sometimes it shows improvement, sometimes it shows worsening, but 
before you just say all clinicians are stupid and do scary things, collect some data and find out if that's just anecdotal or if it's really the case. That was only point one. Point two that comes out of the, the workshop from a few months ago was, a, again, a, a thought that there needs to be some basic clinical decision support rules, algorithms, suggestions, guidelines, but the idea was that smart, highly motivated, opinionated people are not gonna reach consensus on every single one of these things. So the idea probably needs to be to come up with a basic set of what we think is good guidelines overall, but allow at some level, and here's a role where I think NHG or I can fund research or facilitate doing this, allow variability at the regional, local, hospital system base level to say, okay, we're gonna take this basic guideline and we're going to modify it in such and such a way based on whatever hopefully evidence-based situational decision support changes we need to implement here. But where they disagree is that where there's a real disagreement because maybe, you know, our experience with m multiple opinionated curators is that in cases where there actually is something to agree about, they will converge. Yeah. But I'm, that's going to be the minority problem. But that, that's a low-hanging fruit. Yes, but, but as, as Howard pointed out, and as, everyone in this room who's a clinician, Howard. and as everybody in this room who's a clinician knows, the patients come into our office every day, and their question isn't, when should I come back because there's agreement on a rule. Their question is, I'm here today with a problem, what should I do? And those of us in clinical medicine have to answer it. So it doesn't help to have a guideline that says, eh, there isn't enough data yet. And my view of this is that the, uh, the, the disagreements are the opportunities to really frame what is the question that we need to answer because that's, that's basically we're arguing be about belief as opposed to, you know, uh, a truth, if you will. And uh, so if you could incorporate that in the process and say, okay, this is now an op this one looks very promising, but there's this disagreement. This is where we could use, and, and I wouldn't necessarily put it all in an HGRI, obviously, because I think the other ICs have a role. And I think there's also a role for trans NIH efforts like the, uh, what is now, um, I think, called the Health Delivery System Research Network, the formerly HMO Research Network uh, that's funded through the Common Fund. That you know, these are the types of things that can be forwarded to them and say, "Look, who's interested in taking on this problem?" and and look for ways to kind of facilitate this, and and then also develop <laughs> partnerships with groups like uh, Roberts uh, that are in the private sector to say, "This is a question we think you're very well positioned to answer because this is something that we can do out of a claims data set, as opposed." to a clinical data set. Uh, so, you know, it, it's a matter of, of, of looking at all those sorts of things. And the second thing I just want to say in response to Howard is no one says that physicians are dumb. But what they do say is that if you measure any clinical process, there is unexplained clinical variability around that process, which means we do things differently and we don't know why we do it. Uh, I just wanted to uh, pick up on something that I think uh, it was uh, Dr. Kal Kalanji we were talking about yesterday, and that's that you know the work of EGAP. Um, it's uh, been really thorough because it needs to be because evaluating clinical utility is a thorough business. Um, but by definition, that's also meant that it's been rather slow and you haven't had that much. So what I wanted to know is, are there any international initiatives in it? So for example, within the UK, my understanding is that NICE are being tasked with the responsibility of evaluating uh, the, the utility and approval of potential genetic tests. So have you any relations with NICE or, or, or other equivalent bodies internationally? And should that happen to accelerate things? I absolutely think it should happen. The, we don't, so I'll just start yeah. there. The pond seems to be a formidable barrier between uh, us and you. but. Uh, a uh, NICE would be a natural collaboration because the methodology is actually very similar. Um, there are other international activities, but they're not geno uh, genomic specific. And uh, the grade methodology, which is more international and not quite adopted uh, completely by either the UK or the US, um, is another strategy, but it's different. And so while there's a great overlap between EGAP and nice uh, uh, activities, trying to figure out how to rope in um, the the rest of the European Union and Canada, uh, who are uh, who are great affectionados, is something we're all still wrestling with. So um, I guess we heard by a couple of speakers today that any solution to genome-based medicine is going to have to um, 
be scalable. And I'd just like to suggest sort of a related but different concept that um, any solution is also going to have to uh, be a highly accessible uh, one in that in our country we really have such a lack of continuity of care that it doesn't matter whether uh, individual medical centers or healthcare systems have um, access to the same data, uh, genomic data vis-a-vis -vis, um, scalability if um, uh, different uh, medical systems have different patients' um, genomic data, of course, there's an accessibility issue. And so it may be obvious to many in this room, but clearly this data needs to be somewhere in the cloud or in the patient's uh, domain or on a chip implanted within the patient or something along <laughs> those lines. Um, so in addition to scalability, um, accessibility is also an important uh, part to the solution. And yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of efforts on health information exchanges, so I, I think it goes along those lines. Um, just wanted to comment on what NHRI specifically can do in recognizing that everyone's budget is getting cut. And I mean, <laughs> you know, the dot's moving that way, but obviously getting to like the $1,000 genome is the priority compared to some of these efforts. I, I just wanted to ask that NHRI coordinate with some other agencies that are specifically funding tens of millions of dollars in the space. So. Uh, for example, AHRQ, uh, there's a meeting I'm going to go to early next week that's going to be discussing, I think it was $10, $50 $15 million they spent exactly on this topic of translating nationally. And there's the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. So they, it's called ONC, if you're not familiar. I mean, they spend, you know, at this point, it's, I think it's gone into the billions into the space, but they're spending tens, Can hundreds of millions. Of Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, ONC. So, and the... Department of Defense just spent like $10 million on trying to develop this kind of capability. The Veterans Health Administration is spending hundreds of millions of dollars on building a next generation EHR system called Aviva. So there's a lot of folks working in the space, whether it's uh, by, for building systems or whether it's uh, putting together grants, contracts to get this work done. And I think if, if you can get in touch with the right folks and get personalized medicine, genomic medicine, family history-based medicine, incorporated into some of these projects, then for very little money or no money, I think you can get some of this, these uh, ideas advanced. So for example, AHRQ, there's John White, who heads up a lot of this, and ONC just got Jacob Ryder, who was the chief medical informatics officer at uh, Allscripts, one of the EHR vendors who just started as the head of distance support for ONC. And there are people who are very interested in this space, and I think if you can connect with the right people, um, this can be advanced, along with all these other efforts that are specifically targeting the space. Okay, so that seems to be maybe a good place to stop and go out and try and interact with all these groups that are developing things that might be also sources of money. Excuse me for a moment. I'd like to just make an announcement. Um, Jackie and I are in the process of making taxi arrangements to 